Welcome to this meeting of Thursday, May 25th of the regular, of a regularly scheduled school committee meeting. Um, I'm Kirstie Allison Yippie, the chair. Um, I ran up the stairs, which is why I'm like, not able to breathe. <laughs> uh, and we have public comment first. I know that we have some people here for public comment. Let me find my blurb to read. Oh, that's good. That's not the right one. Okay, just a moment. Sorry about this, folks. A little music in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you very much for that. <laughs> this is good timing to cue yeah. up the band. <clears throat> oh, sorry. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. <clears throat> yeah, but that's not exactly right. So, okay. I'd like to review sections of our policy BEDH, which governs public comment. During the public comment section segment of regular school committee meetings, individuals or group representatives may address the committee on items of school business. The length of public participation shall normally be no more than 20 minutes, but may be extended by the chair. Speakers must identify themselves by name and address and will be allowed up to three minutes to present their material. The chair may reduce the speaking time if needed and or may permit extension of this time. Improper conduct and remarks, including the use of obscenity or abusive language, will not be tolerated. Defamatory or abusive remarks are always out of order. If a speaker persists in improper conduct or remarks, the chair may terminate that individual's privilege of address. All remarks will be addressed through the chairperson of the meeting. Speakers may offer such object cri criticism of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel, nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of the Arlington Public <coughs> Schools. Under most circumstances, administrative channels are the proper means for disposition of legitimate complaints involving staff members. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. And I don't have this written down, but I also want to note that we don't respond to public comment. We just hear and we may bring it up later or at another meeting. So thank you very much. Given all that, our first public speaker is Molly Blaugin Gillis. My name is Molly Blau Gillis, 20 Alpine Street, mom to two LGBTQ kids, one of whom is transgender. I have presented to you many times in the context of our work together to make our schools safer, more inclusive, and more welcoming for LGBTQI plus students. No one can do this work alone and do it well. It requires collaboration, optimism, and generosity. For my part, that approach is highly intentional. It is because as a mom of a trans child, I cannot think too far into the future not in today's political climate. No one knows what the future holds, no one more so than trans and non-binary human beings and those who love them. Last week alone, Texas approved a bill that prohibits 30,000 trans children from receiving health care that is vital to their very being. Flora ratified the largest slate of anti-LGBTQ bills in one session in its history. Children receiving gender-affirming care there could legally be removed from their homes. The ADL reported that hate crimes rose in Massachusetts by 33% last year and had the second highest rate of white supremacist propaganda in the U.S. with LGBTQ plus events targeted throughout our state. The news is painful and terrifying. And as a parent of two LGBTQ kids, I have to do what I can to balance it out in my head and my heart. And I do that through volunteer work here in my community. I need to create an environment that looks and feels very different from what is happening in other parts of our country. I have to believe that that is possible. Because if I can't create safety and belonging for kids here in Arlington, in a community that I value and love, what does that mean for the future? I honestly can't bear to think about it. I will say only this in reference to the challenge that was withdrawn. Modern inclusive health and wellness curriculum is critical to safety, inclusion, and belonging for all students. 
curriculum that is truly inclusive of all genders and identities is this district's strategic vision in action. And without action, that vision is words on paper. Intolerance is on the rise and Arlington is not immune. It's our shared responsibility to show our students how to lead by example, especially during challenging times. That includes speaking out against bias and inequity and providing clarity around moments, actions, and words that could be misconstrued as such. To me, it also means talking to each other more, creating the human connection that holds us together. In moments when I find it difficult to rise to the occasion, I look no further than to our trans and non-binary children who demonstrate bravery and courage every day by just trying to be, by just trying to exist. I want and need to end on an optimistic note. This weekend, my family attended a play group for trans and non-binary children. It was a beautiful sunny day. Watching the kids run, jump, play, and laugh together, I thought to myself, there is no greater privilege than living among the magical. Children are the best of humanity. They are what is possible. We only have to allow them to be, to be themselves fully in every possible way. It is our privilege and our responsibility together to enable, protect, and celebrate that magic, that being. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Rose. Hi, my name is Biz LaRose. I live at 26 Park Avenue Extension. Thanks for having me this evening. I have three children at Pierce in first, fourth, and fifth grade. And I'm here to support the new curriculum in the health and wellness um, lessons in our elementary classrooms and ask you to continue to advocate for our LGBTQ plus students. I know you're all aware of the statistics as they relate to our LGBTQ youth in this town and the dispro disproportionate risks they face of bullying and self-harm. Arlington's kids are cognizant of both the national narrative and local politics. When we do not loudly and proudly advocate for them, they notice. I asked my fifth grader what she thought about the new health lessons that explicitly teach about gender diversity, and here's what she said. I can think of five kids at my school who would not feel included if we didn't learn about trans and non-binary genders. Those kids might not want to come to school if they don't feel like people care about them. Our 10-year-olds can identify the importance of this work for their friends and for themselves. We should listen to them and make sure that all of our kids see themselves in the learning that happens in our schools. Teachers in this district are constantly working to build empathy, acceptance, and respect in their classrooms. And this curriculum offers us another opportunity to both stand with our friends in the LGBT community and to make all of our children better, more thoughtful, and more educated humans. I ask you to please be loud about our values as a district and as a community. Our kids are telling us it's important. Let's listen to them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and that's not C. I'd like to acknowledge the AEA representative who is not C. Ferrante. <laughs> Ms. Juliana Keys and Next, we have our AHS representative, who I also hope is not misnamed, um, Amy Chilaru. Thank you. Um, do you want to present what you have? Yeah, um, this week has been a pretty sad week for AHS because it was the last week with our seniors. So each day they dropped a different class, and tomorrow is their very last day with graduation next week, so that's kind of been the mentality around this week. Um, we've had a lot more outdoor events recently, EcoFest, and then the Pride Palooza and Scooper Mania were all last weekend, and everyone really, really enjoyed those, and we're looking forward to having more uh, coming in June and then next fall, and um, our mini sports teams made it to the playoffs this year. I think boys volleyball for the first time in like nine years or something. So we're very proud of them. Okay. Thank you very much. Next we have the uh, summer programming report with Dr. McNeil and Ms. Elmer. I, it seemed unnecessary. 
necessary, but I guess I'll join him. <laughs> okay, so So this is our report for summer programming. Uh, these will be the various extended learning programs that are offered during the summer. Um, the first one is our Title I extended summer learning program. And you'll see, I mean, many of the structures are still in place. Um, the, the things that we've updated are just the dates, um, the number of students that will be attending, because uh, that you know, changes from year to year. And what I would like to just highlight is the selection process that we utilize in order to identify those students who will participate in this program. <clears throat> and so it's offered to students currently receiving services as well as others that are recommended by teachers, students who receive intervention during the school year. Um, so naturally they have teacher recommendation and students not eligible for ESY who would benefit from additional targeted math or reading support. And so the targeted instruction will be reading uh, in kindergarten through uh, fourth grade and math kindergarten through fifth grade. So that's the ELA and the math program, which is the Title I Extended Summer Program. <clears throat> and so this is just the programs based, uh, broken down. You'll see there that the, you have the, uh, the, the instructional team, the different teachers who have uh, volunteered to teach in this program and this is the literacy part of it and you'll see the number of uh, students who are enrolled um, enrolled we are offering both in person and remote <clears throat> I want to highlight that because we want to make sure that we're making sure it's uh, accessible to all students and then you'll see down at the bottom the focus of instruction you go to the next slide this is our math uh, title one program uh, you can click on the summer benchmarks, which will identify the various skills that will be reinforced through the instruction. And then at the top, you'll see the enrollment. Again, this is being offered in person and remote. And you'll see the names of the teachers and the coordinator. Next program, I mean, next slide, sorry. This is our EL uh, English Learner Education Program. Uh, that services grades uh, uh, first through 12th grade. On this first um, slide, you'll see this is for elementary. Uh, you'll see, be, you can read the description of the program, uh, and then you can look at the number of students that are enrolled, the participants, and then the, and then the dates. And then we keep going. And this is the middle school program for uh, our English learners. It's gonna be held at Addison Middle School. The elementary one is be, will be held at Bishop and uh, you'll see the participants and the dates. Uh, the MOOCs is the massive online, open online courses, which uh, is coordinated through like a, a teacher and a teacher uh, agrees to facilitate this and this is allows for um, students to attend or receive instruction from teachers that not necessarily, they, they can pretty much uh, develop their own course and this provides them an opportunity to be flexible on what that topic will be. Uh, the next one is the high school summer programming. Uh, this is the credit recovery. Uh, you can read there about the selection process. It's gonna be in person. You can see the different potential. Um, and, and enrollment is based upon students in danger of failing. Some students will pass for the year and will not require credit recovery. So I, I'm not sure that I'm not, we're not sure that these numbers are the way that they're stated here in the slide is that's gonna be the actual numbers. And you can see the different subjects that are offered for credit recovery, and you can read about the goal. So they can, uh, the students will be able to complete their course materials within the support of in-class time and to be able to continue on their planned um, course of study uh, towards graduation. So the goal is to have those students graduate. And then you have the Play-Doh, um, these are online courses, a variety of courses offered across all disciplines, also for credit recovery. Students meet in person or with the teacher once a week. 
Again, you can see the courses and the enrollment. And again, the goal is to have students uh, achieve their credit recovery, to achieve the credits, and then uh, finalize uh, their graduation requirements or achieve their graduation requirements. I'm going to pass it over to Al uh, Allison to talk about the ESY program. Um, so just as a brief refresher, um, extended school year is a special ed service. Uh, students are individually found eligible through their um, special education team. That determination is made annually for the student. Um, and the goal of ESY is to prevent substantial regression in already required skills or to for skills that may um, require extensive recruitment in the fall. Um, we all know some students lose some skills over the summer, but and it takes a period of time when we all return to school, but it, for a student who is receiving special ed services, if that period of recruitment would be um, greater than it would a typical peer, then they may be eligible for um, extended school year. Um, as we have done in the past, the programs are located at the Bonanabi Preschool, which will still be over at the Parmenter School this summer. Um, the Pierce Elementary School, where rising kindergartners from Monotomy will also attend, uh, the Gibbs School, and then the High School. And again, you see our numbers are relatively consistent um, as they've been um, in previous years. Uh, and our ESY coordinators this year will remain Joy Schlanger, who is our preschool director, um, Annalise Abdel Noor, who did it last year, and um, this year Amanda Donahue, who is a team chairperson at the high school, will also be assisting um, with the K through 12th grade program. Um, I just want to be clear because I know this question comes up every year around the scheduling. Unlike the other programs, they are not set where a student gets assigned to the, you know, three-day um, Title I program that runs from 9 to 12. Each student is individually scheduled based on their services, so a student may receive 30 minutes twice a week of reading and one um, session of speech. So those all have to be individually scheduled, which is why the schedules aren't set in stone like they are with the other programs. We are working. Um, this year we're in a better position um, for staffing than we have been in the last few years where we have most of our professional staff hired. We are still looking for um, TA positions uh, and once those staff are hired we can then start to make the groupings um, and ideally um, those schedules will go out to the families in early June. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions. Yeah, any questions? Any questions? Ms. Exton. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Dr. McNeil, can you just share a little bit about how the um, the literacy uh, Title I support in the summer has changed based on um, the selection of a new literacy program, the work that teachers are doing in the district around um, adjusting their literacy teaching practices to align more with the science of reading? So most of the intervention uh, we use, um, so that hasn't changed much uh, because we use Orton, Gillingham, and Wilson <clears throat> for interventions, and we, we, we still uh, focus within the summer. We have been traditionally on those discrete skills that students will need. So that, that's always been focused on phonemic awareness and phonics. So they're getting that, those structured literacy routines uh, within the, within the um, Title I program, the literacy the extended learning program. So that, that's not going to change going forward. We're going to continue to utilize those structured literacy routines to uh, provide intervention. And that has been the case in the in yes. previous summers yes. as well. Yes. Okay. Thank yes. you. Yes. <clears throat> Anyone up? Mr. Cardin? Um, the high school credit recovery program, oh, not the Plato one, the other one, um, is, that, is that new or do you know when we started offering that? So this is something that we have um, been offering the whole time. I mean, I can, I can check in with uh, Dr. Jenger to make sure I'm, I'm correct. Uh, I think the, the difference this year um, is that the program is being open to students outside of uh, AHS. I can speak to this slightly yeah. too because I spoke with Dr. Jenger about this. So it's a little bit misleading in that the number of students we, so it says 10 students there. That's about how many students we would want to open it to. Um, at, that would be what a full section would look like for credit recovery. We have offered credit recovery in the past. 
Um, we don't have that many students who actually need credit recovery based on the current status of students' credits right now. And it's kind of hard to teach a class of two or three kids in the summer, uh, which is part of where the proposal to open this up to Middlesex League um, communities came from for tuition in, but this is a brand new proposal, so I want to qualify that. Uh, we haven't figured out exactly what the mechanism would be for collecting those tuitions, but we would set up a fund uh, to collect that in and use those dollars to offset the quality of the programming. And um, I wanted to make sure that that was shared with all of you before we made any final decisions about it. Uh, it would make for easier teaching of the course if we had more kids in some of those credit recovery classes. Okay, thanks. I mean, I feel like as recently as when my son started, <laughs> which would be five years ago, we, we were sending kids to Somerville or other places for credit recovery, so I don't know. That I is, can ask. That has not changed. We've offered credit recovery every year. That I've. To other places. Oh, to other places. No, no, no. We didn't. I mean, that you we were didn't sending offer your it. We either did Plato, <laughs> or you had to go to another, another town. Oh, okay. All right. Well, but I'm glad we're offering it. <laughs> Whenever it started, I'm glad we're offering it. Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay. Anyone else? <clears throat> right. Because okay, I understand what you're saying. I, I remember it being at least being presented last year and maybe the year before that so I think it's I can't think of a time since I've been in the district where we have not offered credit recovery during the summer and we've had these like limited limited selections of English um, we've had also had science um, but yes since I've been in the district I've I'm aware, I think that we've offered credit recovery since I've been here, and that's for been the past I six years. I don't know, I would, I, this is a bit of conjecture, but I would imagine that there would have been times when we couldn't offer a class because we had so little low enrollment in it and might have told a student that we weren't gonna offer it and they might need to go somewhere else. Um, this would enable us to make sure that we can offer a wider slate because we would have more enrollments if we take folks in from other communities. Yeah, that's the new part, offering the $600 tuition based from people from other, from the Middlesex League. Okay, any other questions, comments? No, okay, thank you very much. Next, we have the first read on the district goals. Dr. Hummel. Hold on one second, let me pull them up. Um, I'm just going to share the document. I don't have slides with these goals. Um, we can just reference the document that they are on. Um, these were reviewed in CIAA subcommittee. Um, they are pulled directly from the milestones in the strategic plan um, and for each of the initiatives. So there are 12 goals aligned with the strategic priorities and the initiatives in the strategic plan. Um, we, the outcomes for each year and by year are also included in the strategic plan. Um, and if there's a desire to add any more uh, information about our plans for next year and outcomes for next year to this document, I'm happy to include that or take any comments. Does anyone have any comments? <coughs> I don't see any, I, I actually, comments. <laughs> Um, I, so I'm sorry I wasn't able to attend CIA, so maybe that's why everyone else has already spoken, but I was just wondering about converting them a bit more towards the SMART goal format, partly because I'm looking at it with an eye as chair that what I'd like to be able to do is sit down and go, okay, we have this report or this thing coming at this point so I can put it in a meeting um, going forward. You know, so, so we know when things are going to be done during the year. Um, but I haven't had a chance to talk it over, so I don't know. Okay. okay. I don't have a response right this minute. Okay. Um, I think I would have a question about how, SMART goal doesn't, I, I wouldn't necessarily I, associate with a timeline, but I could think about how to well it's that. supposed that's what the T part is right sure but, but but it's more just what what are we getting and when are we getting it is, is kind of what I was wondering about okay so we can we can talk about it more online okay. okay anything else no 
other than that, I thought they looked very nice and it's mm -hmm. great how they just come right from the plan. And makes it much easier. Um, next is the after school programming report, Mr. Mason. Hold on. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, school committee members and those that are here. <clears throat> there we go. All right, today I'll be presenting to you uh, <clears throat> after school program report, um, which includes uh, an overview of 20 of school year 2022 and 2023 overview, and then a, a kind of a preview or a projection of 2023, 20, 2024. And, and include financial summary. Um, in Novus, your, the presentation would have been updated um, to include more recent figures on the financial report. Um, there were some uh, figures that were not disclosed. So the, the, first, the first slide is um, this current school year, um, current enrollment, and where we've ended up ended off with our wait list, um, self-reported by each of the, the vendors that are uh, licensed spaces in our building for after-school programming. And the overall enrollment um, was 630 students for this year, or currently not was, but is, and um, 94 students overall that they believe are still identified um, themselves as on the wait list. Um, but they, many of the vendors say that they, the, the families have found other options. It's not that they're, they're not getting the services, they're just not getting the services in the schools um, under their programs. If you go to the next slide, um, that is the preview for the upcoming year and based on the current enrollments. And what you'll see is that um, most of the schools are, what they've, the, actually have enrolled um, for next year um, has at least increased except for the bishop um, which is showing a decrease currently um, of nine students but they and they have a wait list of 14 um, and you'll see that overall um, all schools enrollments are anticipated enrollments in terms of what's actually enrolled and what's on the wait list for students um, have overall increased except for the Dallin School, which is actually seeing 10 overall students currently seeing less. Um, and so sometimes just thinking about the challenges, their challenges are very similar to what our challenges have been. Um, it's been around recruitment. It's not necessarily that the space is not available. It's just that they cannot recruit um, enough individuals to be able to support the enrollment and or the desired days that families want. Um, um, if they go to this slide, you'll, this is for our internal Arlington after school program and our by school, the enrollments and the wait list for this year. And so, you know, overall, our, over our. So you're over time. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you very much. I thought about it for a second. I said, oh, that was quick. I guess yeah. we're really trying to get out <laughs> on time. To the audience uh, has had enough. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. No, 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 no. Thank you. That that tells me to speed things up. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> the overall enrollment and um, for the our current our internal after school program is uh, 427 students across all of the schools, and um, the wait list uh, is, it was ended around 133, um, and similar to what I just spoke about the challenges for. Our, our internal program is not necessarily space per se. I mean, space is always a challenge, but um, it was um, stable staffing, and um, we've we've increased salaries this year um, to try to uh, make it uh, more competitive to attract uh, more uh, staff to support the program. And um, I think there's there's still some challenges and work to be done in that area, but overall. Um, you know, 133 is the wait list for what we dealt with this year. So if you go to the next slide, which is for our upcoming year enrollment, overall the enrollment is 
457 that we've actually able to enroll for the upcoming year, which is about 30 students higher. So all the schools are seeing um, an increase. Um, there seems to be a less of a demand at Pierce if you look at, if you consider that the wait list is lower. Um, but overall, um, all the programs are able to accommodate more students. Go to the next slide. Um, so this slide compares the, the actual tuition costs on a per day basis for um, the programs. Now this is estimates, I would say, because so it's, it's a little challenging. Um, the one program that's challenging that does not do it by day is the Bishop. So that price could be off by a little bit, um, meaning it could be slightly um, undervalued, actually maybe a little bit higher than um, what's shown here. And, um, but you'll see that all, of, all the other programs are within $5 of each other. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, it's the upcoming tuition for the upcoming school year by day. Um, and you'll see that um, you know we're, the, the Arlington after school program is going to remain level, the, the same cost, but um, and so isn't the, the Dallin program that's by an outside vendor. Um, but all the others are going to increase between two to three dollars um, to cover their increase of costs. And if you go to the last slide, over this gives you an overview of all the finances finances for the three vendor programs and then Arlington Public Schools internal program is to the right. Um, to note that there is a higher director salary obviously for the Arlington School, uh, internal Arlington Public School program, but that program oversees uh, four different sites, I'm sorry, five different sites. And so um, I would, uh, you know, just keep that in mind to note and obviously those prices is a larger cost. But it, it seemed like a very efficient program considering all of the other, when you compare the total cost to the, to all the schools. I will give it to the chair. Oh, I'm sorry. One more. Next steps. Yeah. That's next, Michael. Yes. <laughs> What's next? Um, so we will continue to focus on trying to find opportunities to provide more spaces for the programs. Um, that's always been the challenge in trying to incentivize uh, even possibility of you know, getting, you know, more teachers on board in terms of giving up some of their spaces. Um, and then, of course, last year, I think it's the same thing. We need help, get more staff, you know. Um, so please, you know, let, let your friends know if anyone has any interest, looking for a job. Um, and we do, we do intend this year to do a, a market analysis on the rental costs. Um, it seems as though, uh, you know, we might be under the market in terms of what we're charging at base in terms of like what we charge outside vendors and including the discount that we charge our long-term rentals which include the vendors that rent for after school programs so I just wanted to put that out there and then I'm, I'm gonna you want me to speak to the before care yes I want to hand okay. over to Dr. Holman um, so we had some success at Pierce we learned a lot and actually have uh, between 50 and 60 kids showing up in the mornings um, which is great because it means that they're having some time to socialize connect with their peers and more students are eating breakfast so given that success, but the fact that we also have very low um, enrollment in, from the 7 o'clock to 7.30 hour in the, in the tuition bearing part of the before care program, and even after cutting some of the tuition for that down considerably to try to alleviate some of the concerns around it, um, we still have to incentivize the staffing pretty significantly in order to get people to be there that early in the morning. Um, and it's just not, um, it's not paying for itself. So we're likely going to stop the 7 to 7.30 before care programming time, but keep 7.30 and actually do sort of a relaunch and reexamination of the programming from 7.30 to 8 o'clock around breakfast uh, to try to incentivize more families to come. One of the things that's great about the breakfast program is it provides our students who spend some time on the bus commuting from Boston in the morning with some breakfast time and some being at school and social time in the morning. We love it when their peers are also there with them to participate in some of that. Uh, so we would really like to see that resource more utilized, particularly by families who have an early schedule and need to get to work a little sooner. And so we're going to be taking a look at that and using uh, peers, like I said, as a model of success and seeing what we can do to increase participation in 730 to 8 o'clock breakfast programming that will be of no cost to families. 
So we'll look forward to updating you on that next year. Great, thank you. Any questions? Mr. Cardin. So with, with our own uh, after school program, is like a Thompson in particular, is the constraint rooms or staff? It's, it's, there, it's, it's staff more so, but um, there's been challenges around some, some schools like such as the bracket, for example, you have multiple programs. Yeah going into one building, it's challenging to identify space when you're having multiple programs in the building. So you have the merging program, and then you have the bracket after school program, which is the vendor. And then you have also community ed uh, also doing programs, which is not reported here. They're, some of their, their programming has enrollment that overlap with the different programs in the building, but as well has out, um, other students that may not be placed in those after school programs as well. Yeah, so I know we had planned to have conversations with principals and with Todd or with the individual program, depending on the schools. When are those, have those happened or when are those happening? So we did that last year. Every, but with every single school last mm -hmm. year, took a lot of resources and time to talk about space considerations and what our expectations were. And that's continue, we didn't do a round of that this year, which isn't to say that um, Michael meets with Todd frequently. Um, with the after school program directors, we established some good relationships doing that last year. <coughs> and the expectations have continued to see an increase in enrollment and capacity from that this year's numbers to next year's numbers. Um, so while we haven't done a round of that this year, we could revisit that and do another round of it next year. Yeah, I mean, w one of the rationales, I mean, for, for taking over the Pierce program, for example, was that our <laughs> we thought that our programs would have bigger capacity, right? And and it's, it's looking like our programs are smaller than the private programs at Dallin and in and, and, and particular. So. I'd still like to see us boost capacity. I don't, I don't know what, what that's going to take, but I think we need to, to make more effort to boost capacity, particularly in our own run programs because we have direct control over that. And then, again, looking at our own programs, there seems to be an imbalance between Pierce and Thompson. At Pierce, we have seats that cover um, a much greater share of the school that's a much smaller school than at Thompson. So that, that doesn't seem equitable. So. Again, if it's just a staffing constraint, then you know I know you can't just shift one person and voila, move move seats, and you can't move seats because you've already accepted people. But as you are able to hire more staff, it probably should go to Thompson first because that's the, the school that's most underserved, just statistically speaking. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mr. Schluckman. Uh, two questions. Number one, when we look at the wait lists, I know that. There are people who put their names on multiple wait lists. Uh, have we, are we able to cull out duplicates from wait, lips, wait, wait lists that are across different schools? Do we know if these are unique people, or is this could this be reflecting? I want to. I would answer to say I'm pretty sure that these are unique individuals. Mm -hmm. Except um, I can't speak to the bracket school because the bracket school has multiple programs, but many of the times the families are enrolling to the program at that particular school mm -hmm. um, because there's no, there's, not, there's no transportation being provided to after school to another school. Okay. Um, are we, are, are PARA's teaching assistants uh, in any instances being employed in the after school programs? Um, yes, there are. I think we did, we did actually at some schools shift schedules to allow paraprofessionals to come in around midday, mm -hmm. right around lunchtime to co do some lunch coverage mm -hmm. and then um, do help the instructional portion and then they would switch. Into well, I know in my school. past life that they would do that as an extra job, so to yes. speak. But there, there's, there was, there's some concern around. Um, so one of the challenges that we um, we were trying to address when we were shifting the use of the paraprofessionals mm -hmm. to do that was um, some some of the roles that were in um, the after school program mm -hmm. that's Arlington's um, employees were were getting to a point where they were getting status of benefit eligible, and um, the concern was how to keep the cost affordable. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, the program affordable for the families, and so we felt that it was effective to be able to cost share between the, you know, how do we leverage them during the instructional day, and then as well be able to use the same staff and have this, you know, see the children see the same staff in the after school program and share the, the health care costs. But if the 
teaching assistant is a full-time employee from start of school to the end of school, and they're doing this as an add-on, is, is overtime. They should already be eligible for benefits because they're a full-time de- full employee, right? Um, I, I, I would have to look at how many staff were in that, but, but could you speak to that? Well, I think the after-school program, if they only work in the after-school program, they're still eligible for benefits because they're like 25, 26 hours a week, mm-hmm. and that is over the threshold for benefit eligibility. Mm-hmm. Um, in some cases, they've shifted the schedules where they work basically eight to four. Mm-hmm. They kind of will start mm-hmm. in the after-school program and leave, um, you know, do, do like one class in the after school and then leave because they've been here since eight o'clock in the morning. Um, so we've adjusted it that way. So we, we are also mindful of the overtime expenses. Yeah, in a past life, I mean, I, I had all my parents were clamoring for the after school pro, uh, jobs as uh, mm-hmm. an additional salary. I was just wondering if there was uh, some sort of uh, barrier that we have maybe in our contract or in, in, in terms of practice that might be getting in the way of uh, offering some of the younger, more energetic folks the uh, uh, opportunity to work longer hours for additional money. Yeah, I mean, there's different pay rates for one thing. So, um, you know, we were abiding by the Unit D contract for the paraprofessional positions. Some people are also have after school positions, and we sort of have to straddle different pay rates for those positions. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Spielman. I'll answer something too if you want. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Duke. <laughs> you, that's, a, that's fine. Uh, policy KFD uh, asks for the availability of surplus space within the district to accommodate the needs of families requesting extended day services. So <clears throat> I'm curious to know what's the surplus space available? Like how many, is there any calculation of how many classrooms we aren't using that we could use? Is there any data on that classroom space is not the challenge we have plenty of that and we've been clear that the building is a town building and it's for services like these to take place throughout the day Um, some challenges are custodial timing because we want to make sure that if the kids are in those rooms that they have time to be cleaned afterwards Um, another challenge is shared large spaces so all of the programs want access to the larger shared spaces because you can have more groups in that space at any given time Um, I think mr. Cardin raises a really good point that we've been able to accommodate more families in some of our vendor programs than we are in our own program and that we need to look into that and that space shouldn't be the issue that prevents us from doing that if we're able to fit 170 students at Dallin Um, I know that staffing and pay rates could be something that we need to look into to determine whether or not that's part of the challenge associated with staffing and also practices around how we roster and then staff versus staff and then roster. Okay. So it, 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 there's, there's, there should be enough space. Would there be enough space space to accommodate 200 more students? in the district or whatever the number is if you add up the two, whatever the so if you look at the wait list I'm talking about both the vendor and our, our program mm. if you add up that's like if it's about 220 if you add up both where <coughs> at bracket no where are you looking no you're talking about all the wait all, all across wait the list. whole thing vendor and it matters uh, more to look at by school okay because no. if you look at any one school like if you look at uh, the Hardy program and you take the wait list plus the enrolled for next year, that's 170. If we yeah. fit 170 in the one program that's at Dallin, then right. it's reasonable to expect we could fit 170 at the Hardy. Um, if it's you know at Thompson, you have 125 plus 65. That's whether or not we have the room to accommodate that entire wait list yeah. um, is something we'd have to look into at the space at Thompson because we run a lot of ACE programming yep. out of Thompson. They use, for example, the multi-purpose room. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, what the actual space capacity of Thompson would be would be a good question to ask because they're the ones with the highest level of both enrolled and waitlisted families. And I think when we wrote the policy, the idea was to ensure that the district Mm -hmm. was maximizing space Mm -hmm. and that space wasn't an excuse to the extent Mm -hmm. reasonable. Obviously, Mm -hmm. there are issues with janitorial services. I I understand that, but that was sort of the idea that we were going to try to use every possible space. Mm -hmm. There are stressors placed on teachers too. I'm, I'm aware. I'm aware of that. But, after school. Mm-hmm. but we, when we had that <coughs> debate, mm-hmm. the resolution was. Yeah. And I would say that if I could add that this year we, I mean, 
so there's multiple programs obviously trying to tap, tap similar spaces. Um, but I think we, what you don't see in this report, which is what you're kind of alluding to, is yep. what the surplus spaces are, because we did do some negotiating between the programs this year, so, and, and increasing, actually, our Arlington community education access to the spaces as well, which before they only were able to offer certain programs at certain buildings, and now, for the most part, most programs that they offer is pretty um, at parity at all the sc elementary schools. All right, thank you. Okay. I have two questions. One is, is there any, um, so I know that there are families who are enrolled in particularly the Arlington after school programs, but don't have all the days mm -hmm. that they want or need. Is there any like way to parse out how we're doing, like how many, <clears throat> sort of how you like, there are families that are enrolled and on the wait list as far as I understand and I keep you I, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm asking about the families who are enrolled but also on the wait list because they're not, they want four days a week and they're only getting two or something like that. Um, if there's a sense of how prevalent that issue is or if I'm, you know, just yeah. hearing about the ones that are. <laughs> yeah. I, in terms of the numbers here, I can't give you a clear answer in terms of how each program is calculating that in terms of their wait list. I think that's, it's worth a look, you know, and maybe looking at it as, you know, like a, almost like a full-time equivalent student, right? Yeah. Throughout a week, right? Each day is point two, and and, I, and I'll, uh, maybe this year I'll try to work on that with the programs. Okay. To try to find a consistent manner in terms of what they're reporting, so then we can say, this is what students are not, get, like what families are not getting every single day, and then right. these are the students that are not getting placed at all. And sort of related to that, I know that some families in that position are using both Arlington After School, Pro so I know the most about what's happening at Pierce, and we have you know three different buses who come to Pierce to go to Fidelity House, Boys and Girls Club, and Ready Set Kids, and I realize that that would be much harder data for us to track, but do you, how do you, think about that demand. So I think there's a conversation that does need to be had in the future. I, I'm gonna try to gather all the after school program uh, uh, vendors together. Um, I haven't done that you know, for quite a bit, but um, what I will say is through this reporting process, the, some of the after school program vendors have talked to external vendors like you know, the Fidelity House, and there's actually the concern that if we increase the capacity of the program in, in our schools that some of these other programs may go out of business because they don't get enough um, students to enroll in those programs. And so, I mean, there's a balance that being played here. I, 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 that's what it, one of the, um, the vendors kind of reported to me about some of the conversations that's been had. Well, in that context, I would just, you know, maybe, I don't know if there's survey to be done of families. Those programs, yeah, t some of them tend to be a lot more expensive because of the transportation needs. And then also for families, you know, if your kid is in school on one side of town and you live on one side of town and there, there would be a strong preference to be at the neighborhood school over the privately run program. Mm -hmm. So I, of course, don't want anybody to have to go out of business, but the, you know, I know people driving through all the way across town at 530 to get their kids instead of yeah. walking two blocks, so. Absolutely. Understood. Any more, any more questions? No? Okay. Thank, oh, I have an sorry. answer to the question. Okay. Can we, can we I have an answer to Mr. Cardin's question, because I do not want to leave anybody wanting for information. No. So <laughs> I, what I did was I, um, I uh, sent a text to Dr. Janger, and he replied yeah. uh, in order to give me those details about when the credit recovery was offered. So Plato has been in um, in existence about since eight years ago. Yeah, and then since COVID, we've been offering in-person yeah. uh, credit recovery. Right. So that's a that's a great accomplishment that we should be celebrating. Right. Yes. So right. I just want to make sure that I clarified that because I, I kind of I left that answer kind of Great, thank you. up in the air. Great, thank you. 
Um, actually, I want to go back to the after school programming. So I guess when we're thinking about days and, or people like Ms. Gibelson was talking about, about people not having spots, I think the demand is not consistent across days also. So that's mm -hmm. a question is how many, you know, what's peak demand and how much of that are we able to satisfy? And by we, I mean actually everything in the town because it's, I, I realize it can be difficult for the programs to kind of add staff, you know, have different amounts of staff during the week, so. Yep. Okay. So anything else? Pass, prior, pass, no, okay. Um, next we have the superintendent's report. <laughs> okay. We have so many things to celebrate happening right now, so I'm going to walk through a few of them. Um, at staff appreciation last week, uh, we said congratulations to our retirees and several staff members who have given many years of service to the Arlington Public Schools and who have achieved uh, professional status. Uh, if you bear with me for a moment, I'd like to celebrate our retirees by name. Um, Marie Bassett is a uh, former admin assistant at OMS, retired earlier this year. Kim Brennan, a teaching assistant in Monotomy Preschool. Pam Byrne, administrative assistant at Audison Middle School. Karen Sinar, food services at Arlington High School. Marianne Condon, an occupational therapist at Stratton. Amy Duke, ACE teacher at Audison Middle School. Cliff Fallis, custodian at Audison Middle School. Janet McGuire, special education teacher at Audison Middle School. David Moore, an art teacher at Arlington High School. Carolyn Simmons, an administrative assistant at Arlington High School. Kim Walls, a reading specialist at Arlington High School. And Stephanie Zerjikoff, our wonderful principal at Brackett Elementary School, are all retiring this year. We wish them many, many congratulations and hope that they have a relaxing and fulfilling retirement. Audison Day welcomed some student choice workshops, a student panel, uh, and some outdoor activities and was great fun. I really enjoyed doing a panel on leadership, and I think Dr. McNeil and Mr. Spiegel also <coughs> led. Um, a workshop on leadership, right? Yeah, so. Dr. McNeil led I don't know if our participative <laughs> content, um, but <laughs> it was a lot of fun to hang out with the students uh, for that entire morning. We had our first annual Arlington Public Schools Pride Celebration, which welcomed hundreds of community members to the front lawn of Arlington High School for activities, food, and connection. I know that many of you were able to stop by um, and enjoy the beautiful day, and it was a wonderful first annual celebration. I enjoy first annual celebrations because it means you're always planning on doing it next year. Um, the Thompson students uh, this week were learning about Indian culture and building social emotional expression skills through Indian dance workshops. It was a lot of fun to join a first grade class in some of those workshops that's also pictured there. And our students are enjoying all kinds of field trips these days. They're going to visit their future schools um, if they're transitioning to a new grade level next year, uh, visiting museums, going to all sorts of outdoor destinations, and pictured are our METCO program students who earlier this week enjoyed a day of hiking in New Hampshire on a gorgeous day and I hear it was quite a hike that they were sore the next day because they hiked to the top of a mountain. Um, so it's been a lot of fun lately. We're enjoying being together and um, going on trips together and celebrating everyone who's moving on to new adventures and we wish them well. Speaking of people moving to new adventures, we have a lot of administrative hiring searches that are rolling right now, so, and a lot of announcements that have been issued. So, uh, as I've mentioned before, we have the Bishop and Brackett principal in place. Uh, we recently announced that uh, Wesley Etienne Pierre will serve as our Director of Communications and Family Engagement, uh, that Scott O'Brien will serve as the Assistant Director of High School Counseling, that Mogli Olander, who was interim this year, will be our Permanent Director of SEL and Counseling, and that Jose Farias, who has worked in the business office previously, will be promoted to assistant director of finance in the business office. So congratulations to all of them and welcome to the team. We have a few ongoing hiring searches right now. Um, Stratton is still not on this list, but it is happening. Uh, we have, I will make sure it's on there in 
uh, Novus for you, sorry. Uh, we kicked off on Wednesday and we will be interviewing candidates next week. We'll plan on doing finalists the following week with an announcement at the end of that week. Um, the initial round includes, I think, 16, uh, actually 18 members on that particular hiring, hiring committee. Um, and the final round will include uh, school visits, forums with families, students, um, and administrators, and uh, finalist tasks and interviews with the central office team. We will do the same for the Hardy principal search. That is posted right now. It will be posted for two weeks, and we're working on putting the committee together. Uh, Director of Research Data and Accountability search is completed with an announcement coming very soon, and we're working on the searches at Bishop and Brackett Elementary School for assistant principals with an announcement on that coming as soon as those decisions have been made and your enrollments are in your materials. Take any questions. Great. Any questions? No questions. Moving on. Um, where are we? So next is the update on the APS strategic plan, and this is uh, Dr. Homan and Mr. Cardin. I didn't so, put this agenda item on, so yeah, I'm sorry. I? Yeah, no, no, no. It, it's okay. So I had asked to have it put on because I wanted to be sure that everyone had um, access and saw the. Do we pull uh, it up? Yeah, if the you could just summary? pull up the cost okay. summary, just so that the rest of the committee knows the cost summary work that's been done and that will be presented to the Finance Committee next week. And I didn't want us to be presenting it out without you folks seeing it first. Um, Mr. Cardin, would you want to talk through it real quick? Sure. Um, so you've, you've seen the bottom line numbers, which are, you can scroll down to the bottom. Um, <coughs> Uh, which are, you know, the 1 million uh, in the upcoming fiscal year, 3.1 million, then 1.7, 6, and 3. Um, so what happened was as the strategic plan was being finalized, we were also um, uh, at the same time talking with the Long Range Planning Committee about a new five-year plan for an override, um, and it was all coming together at the same time. So uh, Mr. Mason and Dr. Holman did a lot of work in putting together estimates of costs, even though <laughs> things were still being finalized. So we went back and refined some of those estimates. Um, we, we obviously left the annual amounts the same, um, but we were more clear about, you know, this amount for uh, this initiative um, in each year. And so that's set out in this more detailed view, which we will present to the Finance Committee next week. Um, so the numbers all tie out, um, and there's a little bit more detail here in the, I think I call it, we call it items <laughs> column about what that spending is related to. And that's also in the strategic plan if you go back to that big document. This is just a summary. So any questions, comments about it? <clears throat> You're all welcome to join us. We meet with the Finance Committee at 7.30 on, at the Community Safety Building on Wednesday. So it's to give them a chance to, for us to present the strategic plan and for them to ask questions about what's being funded and why, why we're asking all this and um, why we feel we need an override for the town to pay for everything. Next, we have a METCO resolution, which is from Mr. <coughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, when we went to visit METCO uh, in March, uh, the discussion was, as they were preparing for their lobbying day, that their funding is totally by uh, the whim of the legislature. In other words, it's all subject to appropriation. Other school fu uh, funding has a formulaic approach instead, uh, so that there's a baseline of funding that, that they can expect. Uh, uh, but the uh, METCO folks uh, expressed the desire to have some more stable funding so that they didn't have to spend quite as much time uh, lobbying and advocating 
at the very least uh, stay, uh, stay in one place. So in that discussion, we talked about presenting a resolution to MASC to support M uh, MCAS in their uh, quest for a stable, reliable funding source. And so I'm presenting to the committee this resolution, uh, and if you vote this tonight, we will forward it to MASC um, for the delegate assembly to consider. So I move adoption of the resolution. Okay, second. Any questions or comments about the resolution? Ms. I just Excellent. want to say thank you to um, Mr. Schlickman for putting this together. I think it's really important that the METCO program um, has the stability uh, of the funding that, that they need in order to support their students and support the programs. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. No further questions. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. That's a unanimous vote. Thank you. Um, so do you need, will you send it in? I will send it in um, to MASC. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm a usual suspect, no. Okay. Um, next we have policy and procedures. Okay. Um, policies and procedures have met a couple of times and we finally hashed out where we think we need to be in terms of the policy surrounding uh, curriculum uh, and general complaints. Uh, so we have a series of um, policies. Now, as you recall back in at the April, at the first meeting in April, uh, we had a moratorium on file uh, IJ-R because it wasn't doing what we wanted to do. That moratorium expires tonight so that if we do nothing tonight, IJ-R comes back, and that's not the desire of the subcommittee. Um, what we desire to do and we proposed to do is to take some of the language regarding the uh, uh, <clears throat> parent complaints and questioning of, uh, of curriculum and other items in, in, in the district and merge that into file KE, the public complaints policy. Uh, you'll note in Novus there are two different versions. Uh, one version contains a one-word addition by Ms. Morgan, uh, uh, just to make it a uh, request that the uh, a staff member receiving a request respond to it promptly. So I would recommend the uh, file KE with uh, Ms. Morgan's proposed change. Now, for all of the other policies, with the exception of KE, E and the deletion of IJ-R, we can do this very comfortably first read and it's not going to impact anything if we do the second read on those policies at the next meeting. But because the um, uh, moratorium on IJ-R expires tonight, we would either need to do one of two things, would be to continue the suspension of IJ-R for another three weeks of the next meeting or to vote to suspend uh, the rules to move IJ-R, uh, the deletion of IJ-R and the, and the changes to KE uh, to a second reading tonight. Mr. Thielman. I, I, I'm not the chair, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Mr. Thielman. <laughs> I, I think we should just do the extension of the suspension and then do everything at once so it's clear to the community of what we're doing. I thought about it, you talked to me about it beforehand, mm -hmm. I needed to process it. Mm -hmm. So I move uh, extension of- Suspension of the rules. Uh, mm. To extend? No, no, to suspend the rules and move- You make the motion, I'll say. Okay, I'll, I'll make the motion. <clears throat> to suspend the rules to move uh, policy KE no, 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 I don't, no, 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 I'm no, not no, no, we're just that. moving, oh, oh, you no. want to move the uh, just moratorium? Just the more of the. Oh, you want to extend the moratorium? Yeah, I, but moratorium is a strong word, I just extend the, uh, the, the, the suspension. Okay. So I was going to use the word suspension, but I want to, ex okay. I want to uh, extend the suspension mm. of policy IJR until our next meeting. Okay. 
That's what I was going to suggest. Either way works for me. I'm. Yeah. Okay. Do I hear a second? Okay. So. I'll speak I briefly, but so the committee has, as, as Mr. Slickman said, mm -hmm. the committee has, has come up with a new plan. <clears throat> the new plan is to eliminate this policy and come up with something that Dr. Allison Ampey and all of us worked on and came to an agreement on. And so by extending this until the next meeting, we can, exp we can the public can see all these policies and then we can talk about it more fully at the next meeting and explain what they're all about. Generally, what they're about is there's there's a they they give the public a chance to uh, voice concerns about curriculum and resources, and then they give a mechanism by which the school committee uh, can take an action and listen to um, concerns about curriculum and resources. That's really it. So it 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 answers it allows a dialogue as was expressed earlier, and it allows a process by which we could resolve it by vote. <clears throat> Any further discussion of the move to sus to <clears throat> continue the suspension until next meeting of IJR? Seeing none. Okay. All those in favor of continuing the IJR suspension, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So. That's unanimous. So IJR continues to be suspended until our next meeting, which is June 15th. Mm -hmm. And, then and are there are a couple of other things to deal with. EEE uh, -E -E, -E -E is a minor change, which is a clarification of the use of the policy mm -hmm. pertaining to public hearings. Mm -hmm. the, uh, just to make it clear, this policy only applies to uh, policies mandated, uh, public hearings mandated by the state. Uh, if we're doing our own informal hearing, we use our own regular rules. So I move adoption of BEE. -E. Second. Any further comments about BEE? -E? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that's unanimous. And so now BEE -E has been revised and, and Adopted. And I just want to make note of IGB <clears throat> that we ran that through first reading in April. But we didn't put it on for second read tonight. That will be in the package of second readings for the meeting of uh, June 15th. And okay. that concludes the report uh, uh, on, on the policies. I just want to add one thing is that IGD, just at the, since we talked about it a month ago, just as a recollection, that includes language the superintendent added specifying when we would vote on curriculum. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very thoughtful policy, and I think it aligns with what we've been doing in the past, but it just uh, puts in writing a, a good practice that we've actually been doing. Okay. Anything more on the policies? That's it. Seeing none, we move on to job descriptions. And I didn't actually put initials on these. I can do it. Okay. So we have three job descriptions. Um, one is a family liaison job description. When we had budget conversations, this, just for a reminder, is a position that is in the ESSER grant for this year. It is assigned to the Gibbs School. It was offset in the general fund budget, not in the ESSER budget, but in general fund by uh, elimination of a 0.5 clerical role. And um, is it was originally talked about as a transition support, which it is going to do. It's in the job description that it will do a lot of that work. Uh, but it is the start and at, uh, initial trial of us having some family liaison support at some of our schools, particularly those that most need it, like the sixth grade school that has a lot of in and out happening. Uh, the service, oh, this was reviewed at CIAA um, and moved forward for the full committee's consideration. Service desk manager was, is a reconfiguration of roles in the IT department um, to oversee some of the folks who are user facing and give them some management support um, on the service desk. It is uh, budget neutral. Yes. Correct. Yes. Um, and was reviewed in budget subcommittee and moved forward for the committee's consideration. And this grant program manager is specific to overseeing um, a large grant that is tied to mental health initiatives and professional development um, being offered to our teachers. 
It is fully funded by that grant. It was reviewed in CIAA subcommittee and is being moved forward for the full committee's consideration. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the job descriptions as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion of any of the job descriptions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so those all pass unanimously. Next, we have the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted in one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which case, the, in which event the item will be considered as normal sequence. Warrant number 23266, dated 5 1623, $786,671.06 and the draft of regular school committee meeting minutes, May 11th, 2020. It says 2022, but I think to mean 2023. Mm -hmm. So, do we have a motion? So moved. Second. All in, oops, oops, that's right, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, next we have subcommittee and liaison reports. Uh, budget, Mr. Cardin. Um, did we meet since last time? Yeah, we must have met since last yeah. meeting. Yes. Yes. Um, so we met. We went over the um, uh, the job description. We um, and the fees. Are those not on the no, agenda for tonight? The, no, we don't have the fees. Oops, okay. we forgot the fees. Sorry. All right. Okay. So for, fees we, we approve the fees, which will come before us at our next meeting. Um, and we went over the, um, the summary that we just saw and um, the slides that we're developing for our meeting with Finance Committee next week. Um, I expect to squeeze in one more budget meeting before the end of the year um, to talk about um, maybe providing a little bit more evidence around some of the needs that we, we um, have budget-wise and um, uh, also talking about whatever else we, we need to before the end of the year. Okay. That's probably the budget transfers. But. Okay, and we also voted to approve the multi, the copiers. Oh, right, the copiers, yes, but that's not also, is that, is that coming, does that need to be approved now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry. May I speak? Sure. Yeah, so. Mr. Mason will present about the copier. Lease. Yes, yes, <laughs> you, in, in Novus, you'll see that there's an attachment um, and just explaining the outline of costs. Uh, we chose three vendors on state contracts, solicited quotes from the three contracts. I'm, I'm from three vendors. And RICO, we've had an established partnership for them for a double digit amount of years at this point. Um, they were the lowest, um, but we're seeing that our machines are lasting longer um, and it is more cost effective if we do an, a longer term lease. Um, and so, in the state of Massachusetts, Chapter 30B requires um, the school committee to vote to approve any contract that we would award to a vendor that goes beyond three years. So um, this is why this is being, uh, hopefully that the school committee would, um, would move to approve uh, the award of the contract to RICO um, for a 48 month term. So moved. Second. Any comments? My recollection is that we approved this. We did, we, yes, we, sorry, we recommend approval. Yeah. So we did discuss it. Mm. Okay. At length. No, no just <laughs> <laughs> Any, no, that wasn't, okay. So I don't see any comments. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> any abstentions? No, so that passes. Um, next we have community relations. Okay, thank you. Um, we met on Tuesday evening to discuss the MBTA community's uh, working group who had reached out to Dr. Homan um, to join a meeting that they are having and she had asked us to give her some feedback on um, just how, so, I'm not gonna give a good background on what all of this is, but essentially the MBTA work, Communities Working Group is working on a zoning 
bylaw that they would propose to town meeting um, to meet compliance requirements um, for multifamily housing. And so Dr. Homan was just asking us for feedback around how that might impact the schools in terms of enrollment and um, buffer zones and um, where it might, where in town might be a good place for it, how it might support workforce housing. Uh, so we had a good discussion and we gave Dr. Homan some input and she will take that to the meeting and report back to us. We also talked about the um, school committee chat schedule for the 23-24 school year. Um, there is um, some data about attendance over the last two years in Novus. Um, and so we, and it was just Jeff and I, I should say, <laughs> poor, poor Laura couldn't make it. Um, we, just, we talked about modifying the um, format a little bit and reducing the schedule. Um, and there is a draft also in Novus for you to look over. So it would be fewer meetings. Um, it was suggested that we include an, um, a cabinet team member um, predetermined at each of the meetings and then have some focus topics to discuss um, in an effort to get higher attendance, have questions answered in a more efficient way, um, and always reminding the community members that if they feel like they need to talk to a school committee member um, out without administration, there are other opportunities to do that. But we felt like it would be a healthier discussion um, that way. So please do just look at the draft and if you have feedback on it, um, let us know if we need to have another subcommittee meeting um, before the end of the year. And I think those are updates, thank you. Um, curriculum, up. Before Ms. Moore. Before we leave uh, community relations, we had a school committee chat uh, last Saturday, uh, Ms. Gittleson and myself uh, did it. We had a couple of parents. Uh, the focus was on English learners. And the, the biggest question we had, uh, I'll, I'll write up the results. I didn't bring my computer with me tonight. But the biggest question that was out there is, was the formation of an LPAC. And uh, folks were wondering, <coughs> we're excited about that and wondering when we're going to get that off the ground. So uh, communication from the um, school department to the community about the possible formation of the LPAC would be a positive thing. Okay. Um, next we have curriculum instruction accountability, uh, assessment accountability. Ms. Morgan was unable to attend today, um, but is anyone else on the committee and can, is there anything else that we, that was discussed? Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, so we what, we went over the goals. We went over the position descriptions. We had an update on HGI from uh, Dr. Janger. He's coming in June, I think, mm -hmm. to the full committee. So there's really nothing Excellent. unless you discuss um, about that. I think that was it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, facilities, Mr. Chairman? No report this week. Okay. Policy and procedures, you've already gone. Anything more? No, we've no. talked about it. Okay. Uh, high school building committee? We meet on June 6th. We're taking a tour of phase two on June 13th. I'll talk about seeing if we can add members of the school committee to it because it's that just. That would be a yeah. wonderful thing. You know, well, I, you know. Okay. I don't know if I can make it. <laughs> you can't make it? I don't know if I can make it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try. All right. Okay. Well, we use on reports. Plenty of hard hats, so I think we'll figure it out. <coughs> Any liaison reports? Going once, going twice? Nope. Announcements? Once, twice? Nope. Future agenda items? Oh, here we've got to take this. <laughs> Ms. Exton. Um, I, um, Ms. Gilson and I are working on a resolution related to affirming the LGBTQIA plus um, community and I would really hope to have this for tonight and it didn't work out so I will be bringing that to the next meeting. Okay. And Mr. Schulte. So it turns out that there's this private way right around the corner from the Thompson School, Regis Road. It used to be a plethora of potholes. Somebody paved it and now we've got people speeding down the street and they're uh, Regis Road 
it, it, it is adjacent to the northwest uh, corner of the Thompson campus. Um, and there are no traffic control devices there. There's no stop signs, no nothing. And now people are speeding out of Regis Road across Everett Street. And one of our parents and uh, a five-year-old almost got hit by one of these cars uh, while traveling on a bicycle. Uh, the parent complained on Facebook, which is where you go to complain about stuff, and <laughs> and I pointed the parents to the select board who has the responsibility for placing stop signs and other such devices around, but because it's right adjacent to our property, I'd like to get traffic safety at the Thompson School uh, as a general topic and the Regis Road um, uh, corner uh, with Everett Street in specific uh, to be specific to be specific on our next agenda hopefully the select board in the interim will take up the uh, uh, the mantle and move to put a sign there but I think that I'd like to have that on the agenda for the next meeting okay I'm trying to think of who would take this on okay mm -hmm. okay so I'll put you down for it. Okay. Do you have any questions you need clarified about this? No. If I do, I'll reach out to mm -hmm. Mr. Slickman. Yeah. For the question. Okay. Anyone else have any more agenda items? No. I'm going to find out about the invite. It's just mark your calendar. It's June 13th at 4 o'clock. Okay. We'll make it happen. It's five people. June 13th, 5 o'clock. Yeah, when we toured Four phase one, we didn't run amok. You know, we're no, 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 I don't think, I think it's, yeah. I think <laughs> it's fine. Okay. 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock, yeah. June 13th. Okay. Does anyone want to move to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. We are adjourned.